And so when we live in a world where nerds and fans of like de radical decentralization and privatization have been given lots of money, that's a world where we now have the resources as a community to put our ideas into practice. And, and that's what I'm seeing happen. From Alcapulco, Mexico, this is Anarchast. Hey everybody, welcome to Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the internet. I've got a great first time guest coming on. He's actually, his family is very famous. We've had his father on Anarchast before, David Freeman. Uh, we've, his uh, grandfather is Milton Freeman. Uh, he's got a very uh, libertarian uh, family, not to say the least, especially his father was, uh, is an anarchist. And uh, I don't know if Milton was an anarchist. I, I, I actually don't know that. And that's maybe a question for you. Uh, and actually maybe that's how we can get started. But the main reason I wanted to have Patrick on uh, is because uh, all this craziness going on with the Seasteading Institute in Thailand and if you haven't heard about this this is absolutely insane and I, I want to help in any way I can these poor people who have been just uh, you know I don't even know what's going on I want to get the, the latest from Patry but this is absolutely absurd that these people <laughs> like I don't know how far off the coast of Thailand put a little house there and and the Thai government's like we'll kill you now it's like what the heck is going on so very crazy but Patrick it's a real pleasure to have you on we've met before I believe at Libertopia a few years ago uh, you're now the chairman of the Seasteading uh, Institute and uh, a board member of Startup Societies which is another very interesting thing I'm interested in both uh, very interested we just had Joe Quirk speaking at Anarchapoco this year I've had him on Anarchast uh, very interested in all that stuff and I know you're doing all kinds of stuff to kind of spread freedom around the world, uh, which is awesome. So true pleasure to have you on. And uh, let's just get started with the first question. How did you become an anarchist? By reading my dad's book, Machinery of Freedom, like <laughs> probably many other people. And then <laughs> hey, it that's was... a cool answer. You're the first one whose answer is uh, by reading the book of a past anarchist guest, who is my father. That's pretty good. <laughs> awesome. Um, and I'd say it was cemented by his, his book, Law's Order, because you know, I mean, there's there's all of these moral dimensions, um, but there's also like this economic analysis where you can make these arguments like that suggest that democracies will tend to pass laws that benefit the few at the expense of the many. This is public choice theory. Uh, and, and my dad, using these same tools of uh, analyzing law with economics to see what systems would produce the best laws has some really strong arguments that anarcho-capitalism actually would, that it internalizes the, the benefits of good law. Um, and, you know, I will, I will say I don't know whether anarchy would be stable. There's certainly reasons to think it might not be, but it's the, the system that I've seen proposed that I think has the best theoretical justification and the best moral justification. You know, that said, I'm a, I'm a pragmatist, and part of the focus of our work here with, with seasteading and startup societies is this idea that um, we may have ideas about what kind of system we want to live in, but we don't know for sure, and we don't know how to build it. And so the way we're trying to change the world is to make it possible so that groups of people can build new political systems. In reality, we can see what actually works. And, you know, we think that if there was a market for government, if entrepreneurs could start new countries, that we'd see amazing things. And I think uh, ANCAP is one of the things that I'd most like to see tried. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, that's why I really uh, love the things that you're involved in. I also think it's up to us to really kind of prove these systems work to an extent. We've talked about them a lot. People like your father have written books and many people have written books, Walter Block and uh, could go on, Murray Rothbard and could go on and on. Uh, but uh, a lot of people, we still to this day get a lot of, uh, well, if it works so good, why hasn't it ever been tried? Or, or things like, why don't you go start your own country? Mm -hmm. Well, we, we tried and tried, well, actually, we didn't really try in Thailand. Uh, but, you know, just even trying to have a little piece of freedom anywhere gets attacked so much. Um, but that's also why I've been quite involved with Lieberland. I'm a huge supporter of Lieberland. Uh, I'm a big, I, like, a, like I said, I'm a big supporter of uh, Seasteading. I'm a supporter of startup societies. I'm excited to hear. I know you're working and, and my, some of those might be launching soon. Uh, very excited about that. And yeah, it's really up to us to kind of show the world um, that these things work. And, and uh, I guess one of the, the best sort of 
uh, interludes to that is what happened recently with the Seasteading Institute. And maybe you can give a bit of background on the Seasteading Institute, its sort of history, and how it came to this point. But I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, that this was the first one that, that had really been tried that, uh, that you guys were kind of supporting. And it was off the coast of Thailand. And it was just two people, as far as I understand. And it was in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the water, and the Thai government went crazy. So mm -hmm. give us a little bit of that background. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I guess to start with the, the general, uh, the idea of the Seasteading Institute was, you know, I was kind of dissatisfied 20 years ago with what the options were as far as countries and how you could live. Um, and so, you know, rather than complaining about it or, you know, retreating to, to trying to convince everybody to believe my way, which, by the way, I think is, is, um, is kind of like communism. I think the libertarians don't realize that they're basically communists when they tell everyone, this is the one true moral system that you should follow. Um, people should get to have different ideas about moral systems, even if I wouldn't want to live there. Um, and instead I said, okay, can I look at the world and figure out why aren't there any kinds of countries that I think are really good places to live? Um, and you know, I think there's a general generational difference here with my dad and my grandfather. So my grandfather Milton was very much about finding like good laws and policies and suggesting them, um, you know, rather than say redesigning the whole political system. And then a generation later with my dad, we, we had these decades of public choice, Nobel Prize winning economics showing that democracy is, is not a system for passing good policies. Uh, and so of course it doesn't pass good policies. And if you try to address one policy at a time, you, you're never gonna catch up. And that's why, uh, that's why my dad helped design anarcho-capitalism, this idea that it's a mechanism for generating good laws and that that's a better solution. And so then, you know, it's very natural to think, oh, maybe the problem is that nobody's designed the right system. Then I come along the next generation and say, well, okay, it, the problem is not that we need to suggest better laws. The problem is not that we need an idea for a better political system, because we have that. The problem is there's nowhere to try it. There's, there's no way to actually test out a new political system. It's basically government is, is kind of a, a cartel. Um, you know, it's got all the land and it maintains the right to govern over that land. And so there's nowhere to prove out our ideas and you can only get so far by trying to convince people with, with theory. Um, and so there's always been a tradition of people going to the frontier and finding freedom, building new political systems. America is a great example. You know, for all we may decry the state of America today, it was 250 years ago, an incredible governance startup that used a really, a system that was radical at the time, radically like decentralized. Um, you know, I, I have my problems with voting, but compared to, you know, a monarch, it was power to the people and freedom. And it worked out great so well that countries all over the world have been copying it ever since. And our idea is just, we need to be able to keep doing that. We need to be able to make, make new Americas, but with 21st century ideas about, about how to govern. Uh, and so I started the Sea Center Institute in 2008 with funding from Peter Thiel to try to figure out how to do this stuff in practice. And, you know, it's been hard. The, the ocean is unsettled. Um, but it's also really hard to settle. These things are related. It's expensive, it's difficult, there's waves that you have to deal with. You have to find economic drivers to get people out there because they're not just going to come for no reason. Um, and you know, they're not even going to come just for, say, good regulations and low taxes because there are some jurisdictions with low taxes. Um, and so that's, that's what we've been working on and trying to figure out how to get it started. What's the minimum viable, viable product? Um, and in 10 years, we've kind of built a big community of people interested in these ideas. And some of those people, um, I think, were, were frustrated with kind of our approach and wanted to just go out there and do it. Um, and, and part of what was going on is that uh, from their point of view, even though their long-term goal was seasteading. So what, what this, this group did was um, an engineer with some money, maybe crypto money, he designed a, a new type of platform that we've been talking about for, for 10 years that has a narrow spar and then a platform on top. And because it has very little cross-sectional area at the waves, it doesn't move very much in the waves. So if you take a boat out and anchor it in international waters, uh, it's going to move like crazy. It's going to be uncomfortable. But with this platform, it doesn't move very much. And so they got a group of volunteers together and built it in Thailand. Uh, and then these two people, Chad and Nadia, uh, they went out and lived on and off over a few months on the platform. 
And they made videos about it, about how hard it was to put together, about what life was like out there. And the Seasteading Institute documented this. And I think that Chad and Nadia, from their perspective, even though their long-term goal was seasteading, you know, they want to someday see new countries on the ocean. All they were doing was testing out this new platform design. Well, you know what happens when, uh, you know, when you just go out there and, and do things that piss off governments, whether, whether it ought to or not, is that the Thai Royal Navy uh, heard that these people were on a platform near Thailand. They were 13 nautical miles out, so they were outside Thai territorial waters, but inside Thailand's economic zone. And they heard that these were people who were talking about sovereignty, talking about homesteading the high seas. And important geopolitics here, on the other side of Thailand from where they launched is an area called the South China Sea. The South China Sea is the most disputed uh, area in the world because it has a bunch of oil and gas and a bunch of countries. And specifically, China has taken the strategy of trying to push gray areas in international law by building up rocks into islands and stationing people on the islands because every bit of land a country owns extends their rights over oil and gas further. And so the South China Sea is literally like the most controversial, worst place in the world. You could build a platform that had ever used the word sovereignty. And so Thailand said, hey, you know, if we let these people do it, next thing we know, all kinds of people are going to be parking all kinds of houseboats and grabbing our oil and gas. So the Thai Royal Navy... I guess even you know, from their perspective, I'm trying to think of their perspective, like maybe even the Chinese government uh, would, or Chinese corporations would do the same thing, right? Is that maybe what they were thinking? I have heard, I have been asked um, whether or not, like, these seasteaders were secretly funded by China. But, but <laughs> p people seriously wondering, being like, yeah, I, you know, maybe that's just the cover story for, for exactly that reason. And... Uh, Rather than being like, hey, this is not okay, you know, you guys should, should stop, they, and they issued warrants for their arrest on charges of treason, which is a capital crime in Thailand, punishable by the death sentence or life in jail, and went out to, to seize the platform. Uh, you know, luckily, you know, you're not paranoid if someone's actually out to get you. And uh, Chad had seen a, uh, a, a surveillance plane going overhead got spooked and Chad and Nadia took off. So they weren't there and they, they went into hiding and have, have been there ever, ever since. So it's, it's just absolutely nuts that they, they wanted to test out a new kind of houseboat and the Thai government said that that was treason. Wow. Uh, if I understand the word treason correctly, I, I, I don't like anything status, but that is when you are trying to like take down your own country or something, right? But Chad's not even from that country. Are they they're trying to charge him with that as well? Yeah, they are. And I think they're calling it treason because they're saying, well, they were trying to take our sovereign territory, which they weren't at all. They were testing out a design which someday seasteaders hope to take out far from other countries to places that nobody wants and live there. Um, you know, but, but Thailand got spooked. And it's actually, the situation is worse for Nadia because, uh, you know, Chad's an American and Nadia is Thai. And that means that, you know, from a, a, an international law perspective, um, you know, if, if Chad can get out of Thailand, he's pretty safe. But, you know, Nadia basically needs to either beat these charges or get political asylum somewhere. And, you know, that's the that's the mad world that we live in in 2019. You like try out a new kind of houseboat and now you're going to have to <laughs> seek asylum for it. Like. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's pretty crazy. It's an unbelievable story, and it, it is you know it's, it's funny, but it's, you know sad. And I hope they're okay. And I want to get into that a little bit. But um, you know, a lot of the times that people say, "Oh, if you don't like, uh, if you're if you're so it's such a libertarian or such an anarchist, why don't you go to Somalia?" So I went to yeah. Somalia. There's no anarchy there. There's tons of governments all there. There's the the, the IMFs there trying to figure out how to tax people and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but uh, you know, that is one of the things that they often will the status will say to people like us, us crazy people who just think we should have freedom and not be slaves, uh, is why don't you go somewhere else? Well, this is like one example <laughs> of one 
two people who just tried to go somewhere else and look what happened and you know you did point out the reason actually I'm glad you did because I didn't realize that was the reason it makes a bit more sense uh, of why yeah. uh, with this disputed area um, and I also saw some people you know everyone on the on the internet's an expert right so I saw some people oh the sea sitting institute that wasn't very smart why'd you try it in Thailand first we should have tried it in some other country would be more open to it but as you just pointed out it really wasn't your choice it was these people had decided to do it and and you and seasteading basically supported them because oh cool they're trying to do something like what we've been talking about uh, but it wasn't necessarily yeah. like the seasteading institute did this right that's right so our, our role was was documenting it so we heard about this cool project where people were gonna for the first time put this an experimental structure in the water and call it a seastead and so we were excited to to videotape it and you know look we've been researching international law for 10 years we've published a bunch of papers on you know, what are the best approaches within existing international law, you know, working with the existing system in order to do seasteads. But the reason that, you know, they didn't follow our strategies is that they didn't think of it as being anything like sovereign. They were just testing this structure design. You know, they weren't trying to, to say that it was a new country or, or anything close to that. That's, you know, maybe in 10 or 20 years it can be a new country, you know, and so yeah, they, it didn't follow our like legal strategy for like launching an official seastead, but that's because they were just trying to see how this thing would float and if it would move in the wave. So, you know, it makes perfect sense. But look, I think that this has been a great learning experience. And, you know, as long as they don't get like uh, end up in a Thai prison, you know, in that case, it's it's a tragedy. Um, but as long as as long as they don't, it, it's a real learning experience for, for us in knowing how quickly and strongly governments will react and how careful seasteaders have to be to secure the proper approvals until such time, you know, sometime in the future as, as we can just go out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, so you mentioned Joe Quirk. Uh, he was just here yesterday. We we're kind of doing a strategy brainstorming session. And one of the things we we're talking about is, you know, what's the long term plan for how to get seasteads approved as sovereign? Because in international law, there's no procedure. There's no like UN process to apply to be a new country. They just kind of recognize, you know, countries that secede and have a cultural basis. But we're doing something really different. You know, we want to make new countries um, or help people make new countries that are based on a shared belief in some political system. And there needs to be a process for that. And, you know, look, it may take 20 years to create that process, but heck, it may take 20 years to figure out how to build the right structures and get enough people interested. So I think it's it's worth a lifetime of work myself. Yeah, absolutely. I want to ask you a few more questions about seasteading, but I, I, before I do that, I want to ask, is there anything that we can do to help uh, these people? Uh, the, you know, the, I guess they're probably kind of in hiding a little bit right now. Yeah. Is there any way that we can, like, should we be calling Thai embassies or anything along those lines to put some pressure on, on the Thai government and say, listen, these guys are just putting a structure there. You know, you're trying to kill them now. This is crazy. Uh, is there anything we can do to help? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's a there's a Save Chat and Nadia Facebook group that you oh, can great. get on, and um, I think that they 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 have some uh, advisors who are helping them figure out how to get out of this mess. I think that they're they're okay as far as legal defense funding. Um, I think that that hasn't been a problem, um, and it's yeah. I mean, the thing about a government like Thailand is it's it's hard to put pressure on them, right? You know, unless you own like a a major multinational company or have some other lever, I think that they don't, you know, they don't really care that much what, what we think. So I would just uh, get involved in the Facebook group and, um, you know, look, one great thing about this is that they, they're already getting offers of other countries that are like, hey, you want to design some new platforms that you might build in our country and bring some jobs? You might launch some underwater hotels or something? <laughs> Go for it. So the, the publicity from this is, is really, you know, making Thailand look bad. And I hope that they wise up and drop the charges and stop looking like people who are like freaking out about a, a, a honeymoon on a weird houseboat. Um, <laughs> you know, but but uh, hook them up with other countries that are more open minded. And, you know, look, seasteading is 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 like it's profoundly voluntarist. Like we don't want to we don't want to impose our societies on anybody who doesn't want to join them. We don't want to go any place we're not wanted. It's a big world, and you know we just want to find some place uh, that's happy to host these designs. 
Yeah, totally. Um, and and on that note, uh, I remember a while ago, I think it was a couple of years ago, I heard about the Seasteading Institute working somewhere near Papua New Guinea, I believe, uh, something like that. Maybe you'd know a lot better than me. Um, but um, if so, what happened to that? And, and uh, beyond that, what's sort of the next steps for the Seasteading Institute? What are you working on next? That's a great question. And part of what we're doing is saying, you know, what are we going to do in the next 10 years that's different from what we did in the last 10 years? Um, and I, you know, I can give my, my, my guesses as to that. So I think the, the project that you're talking about was with, uh, with French Polynesia. So the CSA Institute had uh, a memorandum of understanding. So basically a non-binding agreement that said that uh, we would work together to see about creating a sea zone, like a legal area where the CSA would have some independence uh, in, in the waters of French Polynesia. And w we then spun off a company because this kind of work is, is expensive and you want to do it uh, privately once it gets to that stage called Blue Frontiers. And they work to do an environmental analysis, economic impact analysis, um, to, to, to draft the law. Tom Bell, who coined the term polycentric law, and it's working a lot in this space, helped, helped draft the, the C-Zone Act. Um, but it's kind of stalled out. They had, uh, they had, everything was fine and, and things were very positive until they had an election. And then people started saying, oh, these horrible foreigners, they're going to build like factories uh, off, the sh off of our beautiful beaches. Um, and, you know, even though, from what I understand, the, the opposition people who were saying this didn't actually win the elections, uh, the government got, got much cooler. And I think there's still potential to work there. But Blue Frontiers is now talking to other countries, again, like Thailand. It's like, well, we want to, only want to go where we're wanted. And so they're looking for countries that are interested in sea setting technology to, to provide more climate resilience, right? These drowning islands in the Pacific, like seasteads don't care about rising sea levels. Sea goes up, <laughs> our platforms go up. So that's one, one neat use that actually uh, my, my wife first suggested many years ago and it's turning out to generate some interest from these drowning island nations. So that's what's happening there. Um, and in general, I think the, that the routes that we're proceeding on that we think seasteads can best be done are one, what we call shipsteading, which is anything that's legally classified as a vessel. So personally, I think that a medical tourism cruise ship is the best idea. Uh, here's the cool thing about ships from an anarchist perspective is that uh, admiralty law is the closest thing we have to anarchy in the world. And the reason is that, that ships, they travel from place to place, so they can't just be associated with like one fixed specific geographic government. And instead the system says every ship has to register with some country and then the ship is like franchising their sovereignty. So once it's outside 12 nautical miles, as long as it follows certain international rules, it's like a roving embassy. It's the territory of that country and you know they decide what to do. And so it's a virtual association between the ship and the country and there's a competitive market for these virtual associations. So, you know, a lot of people don't don't know this, but it's actually um, it's actually a beautifully competitive system. And I mean, you know, one of my dreams is that if we could someday get a system like that on land, if you could get a country that was like, you know what, we're going to do something totally different. We're not going to try to run our territory. But here's the deal. If you buy land in our country, you pick any country in the world that's willing to like authorize it and be in charge of it. And then, you know, we just make sure that you're not like blowing all of us up or whatever. <laughs> if we had that system, like we'd be done. Like, you know, because I'm sure that you could find if you could go, if you could pick a piece of land and then go to every country in the world, you could find somebody who was like, oh, this uh, anarcho-capitalism thing. Tell me more about it. Like, how much will you pay us? Uh, I'll let you try it. Like, you would actually have a market uh, for these societies to evolve. So I think that, you know, some, sometimes seasteaders who, who are like, oh, we don't want to have to deal with states. We don't want to have to deal with existing law are very against this, like, you have to fly a flag. But, you know, it's actually, like, a pretty anarchic system. And if you can get any country to authorize you, it's like... I think it's not that bad to have to get authorization from a country. 
Yeah, I'd get authorization from Lieberland, uh, so that'd be fine. And um, yeah, I used to actually own a sailboat, uh, mostly for that reason. And yeah, it's a whole, it's very free out there on the oceans for sure. Uh, people don't even realize. I, you know, you're supposed to stop in. Well, I'd be sailing through from Canada to the U.S. to Mexico, and you're supposed to stop in and get your passport stamped. <laughs> I'd be like, ah, oh, screw it. <laughs> it's like I'm not doing it. And they just have a little dock, and you're supposed to go and call and tell them you're there. And it's like, ah, oh, <laughs> whatever. Um, so yeah, it's it's a lot freer. But it, of course, there's a lot of issues as you point out on the ocean and I ended up sinking my sailboat in El Salvador. <laughs> uh, but those things can happen. And I do have yeah, to say, can. when I saw the uh, Thai, um, those people in Thailand doing that um, uh, little seastead and and they showed some photos of it, I was like, I don't know if I want to live on that. It looked like it was about eight feet by eight feet little cube uh, in the middle of nowhere. And I'm a bit claustrophobic. And I, I've seen like, um, I don't know if it's from the Seasteading Institute or maybe it's from Blue Frontiers, some really lavish designs, uh, potential. And I'm like, oh, Okay, that I could live on, but that that little thing that those guys yeah. are working on, I'm like, I don't know about that one. Yeah, definitely. I mean, look, there's two differences. One is the difference between the artist's conception and reality, <laughs> but there's also the difference between what we call like a single family seastead and these like larger, like more industrial park designs. And so, like early on, when when I started Seasteading Institute with Wayne Gramlich, we were looking at these kind of single family designs because it seemed like something like achievable to do quickly. But the more we looked into it, we felt like, you know, given the cost of being on the ocean, you need economies of scale. Uh, given how big the waves are, like it's a lot, it's a lot harder to make a, a free society if it's, um, you know, kind of like little homesteads. And but there's always been a subset of people who was like, yeah, I just want to build it myself and do it. And so that's kind of the strain of, of, of thought that this came from. Yeah, it's kind of funny. You know, a lot, most people who are interested in seasetting are anarchists. So uh, as, as we know, anarchists tend to be a little, you know, out there sometimes and very independent. And I'm just going to start my own. <laughs> that's yeah, what exactly. those people did in Thailand. Uh, very interesting. I want to build it myself. And, and <laughs> yeah. the, the DIY thing, too, is that I think if, if you're into doing things yourself, then the modern world is kind of frustrating because it's usually not correct to do things yourself. We have specialization in trade and mm. you know you end up kind of kind of poor and living a hard life if you build everything yourself. But people who want to build everything themselves are like, oh, a frontier, that's so cool. It's a chance to actually go build everything myself. And you know, that's neat. I love building things myself, but it's also, it's not clear to me that like we can actually go settle the frontier without specialization in trade. Yeah, uh, my shower drain just yesterday clogged up, and my wife's like, "The shower drain clogged up." I'm like, "Well, call someone." Like, I don't even know how to unclog my shower drain. Don't put me in the middle of the ocean <laughs> on my own seastead. So I'm, I'm going to be waiting for more of the community level uh, ones. Um, so you know, you're on a show here where pretty much everyone's an anarchist. Uh, almost everyone's going to be very interested in what the Seasteading Institute's doing. Uh, so how can we support it? What should we know? Should we sign up somewhere so we're at least getting the news? Um, what can we be doing as anarchists to help push? forward this uh, seasteading institute idea yeah great question so you know we're very active on social media so there's seasteading institute pages on on twitter and facebook there's also the startup societies foundation um which which works more generally and on land and with sezs and um you know there there's opportunities as this space is going from from idea to reality you know people are starting to build stuff and sure people are also starting to get hunted down by national <laughs> navies, but um, you know, it's because uh, we're, we're doing stuff in the real world and not just doing artist rendering. So uh, get involved on social media, follow the community. If you have particular skills, you know, if you have capital, if you have engineering skills, uh, we need legal research. Um, there's a lot of ways to get involved as a volunteer and to, you know, if you build relationships with, with the community, there's, there's projects starting up now all the time. This is a you know, it's a time when we're going from, from idea to action. And so it's a great time to get involved and, and keep tabs on, on projects. I mean, you know, I guess, so one thing I'll say to, you know, given, given the audience is, um, I guess, I feel like anarchists can get these ideas of competitive governance that, that all of my work is based around, even if it's not quite in the same structure as, as, as anarchy. But a lot of my ideas center around the idea of, um, of sovereignty, for example, being broken up into different pieces. And this is a lot like you might have different providers in a society. You might have, uh, you know, not only have a private legal provider, you might have different providers for different subsets of law. Uh, you know, I think anarchists get the idea of, of 
law as, uh, as something private, something that you can split up into different pieces that you can remix. And, and, and that's, a, that's a key part of these ideas. Also the idea of, of commoditizing it, that um, governance authority should be done for money, like at profit, so that consumers can choose their government, choose their legal system, and that competitive pressure can make sure that we have, that we have good laws. And you know, the idealized version of this, I think, is something like anarcho-capitalism, where you have no constraints, um, and you're, you're just contracting with private defense agencies who are negotiating the law and competing for customers. But I feel like these, these same philosophies can be applied even to the messy world of nation states. And that what we're trying to do is to like, you know, in for French Polynesia, for example. So France has some amount of governance authority, some things that it's in charge of. It has some rules that come from the EU. And then France gives rules to French Polynesia. And there's a delineation of boundaries. Here's what France is allowed to do. Here's what French Polynesia is allowed to do. And so when we were negotiating with France Polynesia, it's about the idea of, hey, how about you delegate that governance authority to us? And there'll be some things that we're in charge of and some things that you're in charge of. Um, and you know, having, having only some of the authority uh, you know, may not be as appealing, but it's, it's kind of, it's all the same idea. If we can break off bits of that governance authority and have private companies that are implementing them and competing, then we're kind of implementing in a sub part of the world or a sub sphere of law, these ideas. And if we show that it works, that it generates efficient law, that it makes citizens happy, then we ought to be able to kind of bring more and more stuff into that sphere of influence. And so, you know, to me, even though my, my work these days is, is all about working with governments in partnership with them to create um, to create sea zones and startup societies on land. I see it all as like falling within these same ideas of just making it so there's more competition for providing government. Yeah, absolutely. I've often said that, uh, you know, a lot of people think that anarchists want no government. In fact, I want 7 billion governments on Earth. Yes, <laughs> and, exactly. And yeah, and the uh, uh, the idea of competition is so integral to free markets, right? That's the, uh, those of us who understand economics understand that we have the best things in the market when there's competition. And really, the biggest one of the biggest issues with government is that it's not very, it's not really any competition, at least in their area. Um, and now, now there is a competition between governments, and that's something that you brought up. That and that gets really interesting. So you've got, you know, there's a way you can look at the world, and and, and the world actually is in a state of anarchy. It just so happens there's a, a lot, there's a, over 200 very criminal extortion rackets that are, that are doing things in certain areas. Um, but uh, the more that they, they have to compete uh, for certain things, and they do have to compete, uh, you know, there's uh, very real world consequences to, for example, if you uh, raise the tax rate to 100%, all of a sudden every company's going to move out of there, there's not going to be any jobs anymore, that sort of a thing. So you always have these uh, governments trying to figure out how much can they, they take, uh, and but without, you know, ruining the whole place completely. Uh, and then having that competition. So yeah, I'm totally with you on all that kind of stuff. Is there anything, uh, we didn't mention the startup societies too much. Um, I heard about some things that they were doing in the past. I think I've known some people, I think we had someone speaking in Narcopoco about it. Uh, is there any, any sort of news there, any areas that you're working on uh, or anything that you wanna let people know about startup societies? Yeah, definitely, we've got, we've got some great projects. So um, one of them is, is called Ulex and it's a, it's a version controlled open source legal system um, and the idea here is that, you know, I've said for a long time that law is code. You know, it's a set of algorithms and decision-making processes. And, you know, for me, part of the idea of, of anarchy is that, um, that law is like a technology that we should be continually like developing and testing and experimenting with. Um, and that like it ought to be really, you know, it's not like a new way of distributing electrical power. We're like, man, we wanna try some new power line technology. We've gotta like freaking put in new power lines. But like law, it's this virtual layer. Like it happens by agreement. And so I feel like we ought to get the kind of experimenting and remixing that we get with software. Like that should be the world we live in where there's like, hey, I'm doing a business. I wanna look for a place that has like biotech law, you know, version 3.1 with like office space under $27 a square meter. Um, that's how it should be, but, but it isn't. Instead, law is like, has this tight association with like local history and context. 
And this is why, you know, I know not all libertarians are fans of Dubai, but I think that what they did was incredibly innovative, where when they founded the Dubai Financial Center, they said, we want to be in the business of being a financial center for the Middle East. Our legal system, which is based on, on traditional Sharia law, is not very good for that. Let's look around the world and find the best legal system for doing this. Oh, it's British common law. Okay. We're going to designate this zone to have British common law and hire retired British judges to run it. And so they actually treated law as this kind of key infrastructure. And I think that's really amazing. And that's, that's what we want to see people, see countries doing more of. Yeah, totally. Uh, you know, Dubai is another good example of a place that's trying some new things. It's, uh, you know, trying to have a, more freedom in, in various ways and then very successful. And, you know, Hong Kong, Singapore uh, and a lot of the free trade zones and so, a lot of these free trade zones are very unknown to a lot of people. But there is a fair amount of them across the world. Uh, and, um, you know, all we're trying to do is to innovate in, in those directions. So super excited about both of them. I can't wait to hear more. Um, we'll put links to both websites and, and uh, any other links you want to let us know about where people, uh, because we do have a, a fairly big audience and a very passionate audience who, who want to donate their time, their, their, their skills to certain projects. So uh, maybe just let people know again where they should go to uh, if they want to try to participate in either uh, the Startup Societies or the Seasteading Institute. Yeah, definitely find, uh, find the Seasteading Institute on Twitter at Seasteading. Um, there's at Start Societies for the Startup Societies Foundation. Uh, and they both have, have very active Facebook groups, and you can find out about our, our projects and how to get involved. I mean, mentioning Singapore reminds me of something, and, and that's that, you know, I think that sometimes uh, it, there's this question of, like, at what level does anarchy happen and the degree to which um, everything should be, like, decentralized, or if we're consumers who have, like, the freedom of exit, maybe it's okay if organizations are run in a centralized manner. I think as... As fans of decentralization, you can go too far and think that like there should be no companies, um, you know, just like decentralized networks of value. And and I feel like uh, I feel like the iPhone is great because it was created by a hierarchical organization that had one vision. And you know that's not tyranny as long as I don't have to use it. And that the problem with with governments right now is that we we can't compete. Uh, it's hard to switch countries. And that Singapore, for example, you know, is Singapore run. Um, in a, a, a totally like libertarian manner, like no, but they've clearly been able to make a very economically prosperous society. And as long as they're an option among many options that people can choose to go to, you know, I, I think that it's it's really hard to get things to work totally decentralized. And so, you know, my vision is all of us as individuals and our businesses having free choice between a bunch of providers, you know, many of whom may be internally tyrannical or hierarchical if that's what produces the best product. And that's totally fine as long as I can switch. Yeah, as long as it's all voluntary, as long as no one's being forced to participate in it, uh, yeah, I'm totally open to all of that as well, as long as it's all voluntary and uh, people have the option. And in today's world, you just don't have that many options and we want to just provide more options. And, and it's as simple as that. And and uh, really looking forward to it. You know, Patrick, just uh, for maybe a final comment here, uh, you have a very libertarian family. We didn't really get around to talking about uh, your grandfather and what his sort of political uh, views were, but your father became basically a narco-capitalist, and, and you, you essentially did as well. Uh, uh, Milton, as far as I understood, it was quite libertarian. Uh, he was very, uh, but he was, he was definitely like kind of a status still. Um, um, so from your perspective, seeing your family and seeing the changes in the world, and now there's a C-setting institute and the, the startup societies, there's Lieberland, Roger Veer's trying to buy an island. Uh, we're trying to deal with all these things. It must be kind of, ex I, I personally find it all very exciting. And I, I've, I've been around as a libertarian, like I've I've always said I've basically been an anarchist since I was born, but I didn't realize, I didn't know what the word meant till about 20 years ago. And in those 20 years, the changes have been massive. So from your perspective, given your family history and everything, how, how is this, uh, you know, how excited are you about the future? You know, I, I think I ought to be super excited. It's just ho so hard for me because I'm always kind of like heads down pushing it forward. And, you know, it seems like it's such a big thing to try to create free societies in the world. And, you know, you have to push so hard for so long. And I'm always focused on like, how can we get it a little farther? How can we get it a little farther? But I, I totally agree if we stop and zoom out and look at, you know, by any metric, by the number of, of projects and like plausible proposals, by the amount of like capital that people interested in these ideas have, 
the, like the amount of business experience. I mean, it it's incredible. Uh, I, I feel like I feel like one metaphor that I use sometimes is uh, to look at like the dot com and then like the crypto booms. Like, what kind of people did that enrich? You know, so before, I, I, well, there were great industrials, for example. Mm. I feel like a lot of people who are really successful were successful because they were, um, I don't know, either like leaders or like politically connected or like your like jock varsity team captain mm. leader, you know, which is great, but it's, it's limited. And then dot com, it's suddenly like it made nerds rich. Uh, <laughs> you know, you know, people who understand technology and are willing to try to do things new ways. And that was incredibly exciting, and that you know provided a like look. The CSAN Institute was funded by Peter Thiel, who was the first investor in Facebook. You know, I was able to work at a nonprofit for some years because I had worked at Google quite early and could support myself for a while. Uh, it was really you know that tech money that, that that powered this stuff taking off, and of course the internet helping us all to connect. And I think what's pushed it over the edge is is cryptocurrency. And you know, look, I have my concerns with a lot of the specific crypto projects. I think that there's a lot of like hype and foolishness, but it's hype and foolishness around an incredibly powerful idea and, a, and an idea that has, has enriched people who were skeptical of inflation, who were skeptical of fiat money, who thought maybe <laughs> private groups should do the things that governments had been doing, who think in terms of decentralization naturally, like that's our people. And so when we live in a world where nerds and fans of like de radical decentralization and privatization have been given lots of money. That's a world where we now have the resources as a community to put our ideas into practice. And, and that's what I'm seeing happen. And I think, I think it's incredibly exciting. Like, you know, it's, it's still going to be quite a battle. And I think it, it matters now whether these projects are done well. I mean, I think that the, the Thailand experience taught us a lot. I think it's, as, again, as long as Chad and Nadia stay safe, I, I think that we, we benefit from, us, from it. But, um, you know, if somebody kind of does you know, goes out and does a project that, like, if somebody goes out and says, on the high seas, I am going to, like, make it easy to sell your organs, you know, if you want to sell all your organs to support your family, like, that's okay with me, like, that's going to be really bad, uh, you know, and, and finding, finding ways to, to shift the world that will get us as far as possible without uh, provoking the kind of like disgust and revulsion that a lot of people have about a lot of topics is really important because we're at this you know critical moment where the ideas are hitting reality and people are going to be willing to say hey you know I didn't believe in this stuff before but I see I see cryptocurrency working to replace money I see that you've built this place uh, that has different rules and like seems like a great place to live uh, and and so I think it's really important to build step by step. So it's an exciting time, also a dangerous time, and that's why I tend to stress out more about trying to move it forward in the ways that'll work than get excited. So I, I appreciate your your reminding me. It's absolutely. It's like, it's crazy how far we've come. Yeah, and I, I I know through experience that there's no such thing as bad press. And when I first heard about the Thailand thing, I saw some people like, "Oh, this is a disaster for the Seasteading Institute." I was like, "Ah, oh, no, I don't think so." Like, I think uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of people just found out about the Seasteading Institute. And I, I always like to say, if you're going to fail, fail spectacularly. <laughs> and and so they <laughs> so they started it up, and all of a sudden they're they're being hunted down by the Thai government. It's like that's that's amazing. Like you know, not, I don't like boring stories. Like that's a great story. Yeah. And like you said, as long as they're safe, that's all that really matters. And uh, but the I think movie it doesn't sell themselves, you know. And like the the, the Seastead reality TV show, it's now yeah. it's now that much more plausible. I mean, that's that's the great thing about having, um, you know, when the people working against you are kind of uh, like these old structures that have had power for a long time and don't understand how the world is changing. They do things like playing right into the story of like you know Navy goes and assaults poor couple honeymooning on floating floating home. So I, I do think as long as they stay safe, it's uh, it's good publicity and a good learning experience. Yeah, totally. And as to your other point about uh, uh, anarchists uh, making money, um, uh, I'm a, like a poster boy for that. I made uh, a lot of money with the uh, dot com back in the '90s. Uh, it went up to 240 million dollars, and then it went to zero wow. after the after the tech <laughs> bubble crashed. And then I had to learn what central banking was, and I read the creature from Jekyll Island. And then I became basically after Doug Casey told me I was an anarchist, I became an anarchist. Uh, and then uh, I was one of the first people into cryptocurrencies. I read, I recommended Bitcoin at three. In 2011, so I'm like the poster boy for what you just said. And yeah, I remember 20 years ago when I sort of when I, Doug Casey told me I was an anarchist, and I, I was like, oh, I didn't even know there was a word for what I was. And um, 
I got I got a little bit into it, and I was like, man, all these anarcho-capitalist guys, they're, they're all broke. They're not very good at the capitalist side of things. Uh, of course, there was a couple that were re doing really well, people like Doug Casey and Rick Rule in particular. He's a billionaire. He's an anarcho-capitalist. Uh, and then there's people like Peter Thiel and all that. But uh, the, the people that I was seeing like uh, at conferences and events, so they're like all broke. Uh, but then the cryptocurrency thing happened, and uh, a lot of them actually made some capital. And now we're actually getting to see what happens when uh, these crazy people with their crazy ideas have some capital. Uh, so super exciting times. Thanks for coming on, Patrick. I'm not going to put you on the spot and ask you right now, but you have an open invitation if you'd like to speak at Anarchapoco next year because I love what you're doing. Uh, we had Joe Quirk this year. We try to change it up every year, have different speakers. It'd be great to have you. If you're interested, just let me know. And uh, we'll put the links to all the stuff you're doing down below. Super excited about it. And if anything occurs and you want to let our audience know, just let me know. We'll have you back on because I'm one of your biggest supporters of what you're you're doing and I want to see these things take off so uh, if you uh, like this video please like subscribe share down below let people know uh, about what's going on and how we can uh, all get involved to to build a better world and it's really up to us it's really about human action uh, we've had all the best ideas uh, in our opinion for decades now and we've had all the best scholarly books and all that kind of stuff now it's time for us to prove it and get out there and do it and that takes human action and that takes getting off your couch and getting out there and getting involved whether it be with the seasteading Institute or with the startup societies or in uh, Lieberland or wherever it is or cryptocurrencies, uh, you have to get involved. But if you do, uh, we do have a bright future ahead of us. Uh, it is possible. And I think it's going to go a lot better than uh, the first attempt there in Thailand. <laughs> I don't think we're all going to end up uh, being chased down and, and hopefully not killed, but like uh, that sort of a thing. But um, uh, and just look at how that occurred for them. So even if with uh, Chad and his, uh, I think it's his girlfriend or wife, uh, you know, as bad as it was, they're now getting all these opportunities uh, of put to them where people, uh, countries are like, come come to our country and, and do your thing. So so there's always a positive and a negative uh, sort of thing. You always take a positive out of every negative and uh, just keep pushing forward. And that's what Patrick's doing. So once again, Patrick, thank you. Thank you for coming on. I've been wanting to have you on for years. I don't know how we never did it till now. I know you're incredibly busy, but thank you for coming on. So that's it for Anarchast. You're home for Anarchy on the internet. Peace, love, and anarchy. His armpits dripped like a wet sponge. Hard racing. Hard to breathe. Every second, watching the price of Bitcoin plummet made his jaw clench tighter. Should he hodl? Sell? Double down and buy more? And then, when Bitcoin shot up, his uncertainty caused him to hesitate again, costing him thousands in lost profits. In fact, whether cryptocurrencies were rising or falling, he didn't know which way to play. But you don't have to lose like that guy, wishing he could trade like a whale, but knowing he'll always be a sardine. Unless he gets schooled on how to trade crypto like a pro. Jeff Berwick was the first financial analyst to recommend Bitcoin at $3 in 2011. If you had bought $1,000 worth, you would have made almost $6.6 .6 million by 2017, enough money to set you up for life. Then he recommended Ethereum at $2 in 2016. If you listened, $1,000 would have turned into a cool $1,116,895. That's enough for a second home, a trip around the world, and a brand new car, with a few hundred thousand left over for whatever you want. But that's not all. Jeff also nailed the timing on Dash and called EOS an early winner at only 50 cents, making his subscribers a fortune. But Jeff will be the first to tell you, the winning picks didn't all come from him. They were precise targets from his top secret group of advisors, a group he's held a vice-like grip on. But for the first time, he's sharing his advisors with a small group of smart investors. Together, these cryptocurrency geniuses have created wins of 4,224%, 124,900%, even 317,900%. But he's only opening up this golden ticket for the next few days. And once the door closes, we don't know when or if it'll open again. Even if it does, you'll have missed out on massive potential gains, and you can be sure it'll be at a higher investment. Plus, you'll have lost out on the priceless information you need to keep your transactions 100% safe, so you don't end up in prison or much worse for someone else's mistake. The time to act is now. If you want to stay safe and make crypto investments with 99% greater certainty than everybody else in the crypto Wild West, visit dollarvigilante.com advisors right now to learn more.